all welcome uh, Trinity Church and friends and guests from wherever you might be. Thank you for joining us again this week for our uh, continuing conversation with Dr. Lori Hamilton, a fellow Trinitarian, about health and wellness at this time of what we uh, can rightfully understand as a moment of trauma and disruption and disaster. And last week, Dr. Hamilton shared uh, quite a bit with us about the nature of trauma and the nature of our emotional well being in moments of trauma and disaster. And Lori, I just was so thankful last week when you illuminated for me, and I'm sure for others, that the situation we're in is much more akin to something like a a world war uh, than it is to uh, say a natural disaster such as a hurricane. And you pointed out uh, that was uh, you know, just so helpful for me to kind of put things in context, how we have, uh, first of all, a physical threat that is not going away. We have a economic threat that for uh, some of us feels more relevant or more immediate, let's say, than the physical threat, even whether or not it's true or not, it feels that way. And then the ongoing disruption, the nature of this being an ongoing situation, uh, a situation where none of us really kind of have a, any sense of grasp on, on when it might end. And you called this a trifecta situation and it was just so um, uh, enlightening to me uh, to kind of put the context of uh, how it is that our emotional well-being is is being affected by by all all three of these these things do I did I get that right once again you elucidated and repeated perfectly <laughs> <laughs> okay great well, we're here now to kind of address some questions that have come up from last week and that we've, we've received a couple. And um, we know that just one or two questions often uh, is a question that uh, many, many people have and can uh, be a really uh, blessing for more than one individual. So let's start with the question we got. Um, from one person that asked if you could expand on the idea of how uh, the nature, the human nature of blaming others and shaming others uh, is a dynamic in our uh, health and well being under situations of trauma and disaster. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, it's, it, it occurs so frequently that I would say probably in any either trauma that I've been um, responding to or disaster situation that both blame, blaming behaviors and shaming behaviors are very present. Um, I mentioned last week blame where we assign responsibility for how something came about um, is is a way of taking control. Mm. If that, and this is probably a very a very central aspect of what happens to us, both physiologically, psychologically, and probably spiritually as well. Um, when we are in traumatic circumstance. Uh, and, and I should say that trauma is best understood as a, a threat, a life-threatening situation physically or psychically. And psychic, mm. in this sense, it isn't psychic, like, you know, call your psychic at 1-800 hotline. It's uh, right. psychic, uh, the sense of yourself. Okay. So something that would, would so threaten your sense of self is a trauma. Oh, and, oh. And, and that's very obvious. So yes. if, if you are financially ruined, you have a business and you're financially ruined, um, 
if your sense of self is tied up in that business, that's the kind of thing, you know, we heard stories during the Great Depression of, of people jumping out of skyscrapers when their right. business went bankrupt. Right. right. Um, so having that feeling that your life is being threatened, either your physical life or your, or your psychic life, is such a feeling of out of control mm -hmm. that the natural tendency is to figure out a way to get in control. Just think of you're in a car and it's skidding around on the highway. You're not going to sit there and say, oh, gee, I'm going to enjoy this ride. No, you actually try to get control of the yeah. car, right? Yeah. So with um, blame, if you can, if you can determine who you think is the cause of whatever happened. And this can be a person, this can be a government, this can be uh, a social group. We saw that in um, Germany with the Nazis blaming the Jews for everything. So a group could be responsible for all their ills. Um, or uh, lots of time who comes up as the culprit uh, for blame is God. In other words, it was God's fault that this happened. And this can, this causes a, a real um, disruption in the psychological sense, because if you're furious at God, or if you're furious at the powers that be, but you also are depending on them for your safety, mm -hmm. it's like, it, it's very, very conflicting. And right. We've got lots of words for that in psychology. I won't bore you with them, but <laughs> it's very unpleasant. So it's much easier if you can find a nice, um, a nice either person or group to blame ends up being a lot easier. <laughs> and especially if they don't have any control over you or they don't have any power over you. Right. Okay. The other part of this is shame. Now, there's two ways that shame works. One is we decide it was our fault. Okay. So if I have a uh, horrible thing happen when I'm driving and it's because I wasn't paying attention, I was fiddling with the radio and all of a sudden I'm skidding. It's like my fault. And then particularly, well, if it's just damage to the car, I might care a little bit, but not really, but oh my yeah. God, if somebody got hurt, yeah. then I am responsible for that. And I am so ashamed of my behavior causing harm. Right. This also happens in the wildest ways where um, I, I see this, I've seen this so many times in a family where, um, oh, a uh, somebody has died unexpectedly and and kids have a tendency to feel that they were the cause of it mm. and that they had done something different but actually i guess it's the kid in all of us yeah, feels that's a great responsible way. sort of if yeah. if i had done something different if i had gone to visit them that day yeah that wouldn't have been the day they died or if i had called or if i had done something different, I could have stopped it. Okay, right. so that's the shame piece where we're taking control, but it feels bad yeah. by, by blaming ourselves. And then of course we have shame where it is part of the blame part where I've decided you're responsible for what happened and now I'm gonna shame you. So yeah. if somebody Oh, we're seeing a lot of this with the masks and who's wearing and who's not wearing. Right. Um, and trying to bl uh, both blame the other person for their behavior and shame them into um, a social, um, socially correct behavior. Right. I'm seeing it from the other side, though, because uh, for people who really are not seeing the virus as being as much of a threat, then right. they're blaming people for the economic 
and the social disruption, mm -hmm. they're blaming the people for being too scared mm -hmm. and trying to shame them mm -hmm. about their fear behavior. Right. Okay. Right. And well, this is so... so that's very common in a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is so helpful for you to kind of illuminate and give us this context of the type of ways in which in which we have these, I don't know if it's fair to call them natural responses or natural human yes. responses to trauma and disaster. But, you know, as a psychologist, I'm, I'm sure you are uh, um, uh, just fascinated, if you will, if it's okay to say that, with seeing this play out so almost so perfectly in in this situation. And, and um, you know, well, it's, it's kind of a fascination that I might have if I was having a surgery and I woke up and the anesthesia had worn off and the <laughs> surgery is still going on. And I'm saying, oh, this is pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm right in the thick of it, you know. Right. You <laughs> are right in the thick of it. But I just, I really do want to, I hope all of us to see how we, all of these pieces are interplaying that, you know, if I'm an individual who personally and perceiving and not just perceiving, but truly, you know, maybe given my health makeup, um, really I, I'm, I'm a business owner perhaps or something. And, and the financial threat really is more of a threat to me than the physical yes. threat. And so to have almost this response to, let's just, for example, not that this is about this, this uh, program is about this, but, um, have uh, have the you know it it comes out in my response to how the mask wearing wearing them not wearing them and how I respond to that, whereas for others who may have elderly people in their life or themselves be health compromised, the physical threat is greater. So the re the reverse response to the mask wearing it's just right. and uh, you know of course as as people of uh, disciples of Jesus, <laughs> the call is to have everyone in our care. <laughs> and, well, it's, and it's that kind of awareness and knowing. Yeah. The, the phrase we use in, in um, disaster work, by the way, or trauma work, I guess, is where this really comes from, is that these are normal responses to an abnormal situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. One of the mottos I've been using in my own just way of walking in the world during this time is, and, and constantly reminding myself, not because I don't tend toward something, but is no judgment at this time. You know, everybody is trying to work their way through this this situation as best that they can. And so it no situation is helped by me heaping shame on someone else, um, even if I have a tendency to not agree with the way that they're, they're uh, behaving in this moment. Um, uh, I'm trying to have like empathy. Um, I've had, but let me tell you, I've had my moments <laughs> where, well, where- I, I agree. And you, you were referring to as a disciple of Christ. Yeah. You know, what, are, what are the teachings what, what did the, that amazing teacher have to say about people who were, who were opposing you in, in your belief? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I see over and over again is that he had an amazing ability to avoid shame. Yeah. While at the same time, not agreeing right so instead of doing a how could you behave like that you know what an inconsiderate sod you are yeah right which is a blamey shamey kind of thing right it's um i understand you don't have let's say it's a person who is more afraid of the financial or, or disruption yes. in the era of the virus. Okay. Right. I understand that you don't have the same level of fear that I do, 
it would be very helpful for me if you could if you could honor the fact that I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and I'd really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um on the other hand, that's easier said than done. It is Thanks. easier said than done, but <laughs> I haven't but I, I haven't walked on water for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, neither have I. Yet <laughs> we just read the story, so we've all been reminded of of the story, um, yes. and that there is someone who did walk on water and and, and was amazingly grace filled. Grace filled about hu normal human behavior. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't, we're not going to dwell on this, but I think what okay, <laughs> one of, no, no, I, what, I, what I'm about to say is that I think what makes this so much more challenging in our current day is the, um, is that so much of our current culture is um, oriented toward using shame to get everyone to behave in a certain way or another way. And it's, um, it's become a, a, a major tool of kind of social, um, uh, not coercion. Not, uh, coercion. Um, and it's not that I don't understand it, but if it doesn't, you know, um, if it's not the way you tend to work, <laughs> or if you tend to believe there is a higher calling to how to, uh, um, uh, interact with our fellow human beings and to be in conversation with them and to and to walk together uh, talk uh, you know uh, um, uh, work together on on how we live together how do we live together as human beings then then it can be a lonely place to be because <laughs> uh, there there is a, a great tendency in our greater uh, cultural uh, space to have no no shame, so to say, <laughs> in using shame <laughs> as a uh, motivator of of changed uh, behavior. Um, so, anyway, uh, let's um, uh, move to another uh, question that we got, and um, this question had to really go with again this kind of ongoing uh, disruption and the dynamics of our health and well-being through this type of situation. And it, uh, we're wondering if you could, <clears throat> pardon me, say a few words about um, whether or not people find it, uh, uh, you know, what is the dynamics behind those who might be, might be more reluctant to seek treatment for COVID um, because they are, they would think that they would be shamed for for it. Um, yeah, what what would you say about that? I <laughs> I've been seeing that play out over and over again mm -hmm. uh, in terms of well, it's a little it's a little more complex. Uh, people who are avoiding. Uh, seeking treatment for all sorts of things because of the COVID situation, but are also concerned about asking for help around COVID worries. So uh, because of the delays in testing and the difficulty in getting testing and the long time that testing results were taking, um, a lot of people were saying, what's the point unless I'm, I'm really sick. And then the issue is, should I be going to the hospital or not? Yeah. Um, but likewise, a lot of people who might, I've, I've just heard at this point, too many situations where a family member was having, you know, some heart issues and they didn't go to the hospital because they were worried they'd be turned away because it was not COVID related, yeah, uh, or that they'd be in the emergency department and get exposed to COVID, so that they'd get a you yeah. know double whammy. Yeah. Um, and in general, my concerns around people not having access 
to good treatment, and this would be a real part of the disruption issue, is uh, it is absolutely showing all the holes in our existing health system and in our mental health system that people already had had a lot of trouble getting access and that this has made it much, much harder and more complicated. And of course the people, the health workers, uh, and I've got lots of health workers in my family, um, are, are absolutely being overwhelmed by these issues. Like my, my nephew and, and my son and, and daughter-in-law have to shower, have to dress and shower uh, in the garage when they come home before they come into the house because they've got little kids who would immediately swarm them so they can't safely get to a bathroom there. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and, and uh, work friends who are exposed and dying and then their own concerns about their own health, you know, that they're, they're avoiding oh, having regular dental visits you know, which is okay if it's a couple of months and it gets to be problematic if it's eight or 10 months. And they have really great health care. Right. <laughs> what about the people right. who, who not so much? And that, I think, and we see this actually, you know, in a disaster, we always see where the holes in the infrastructure are. I mean, if you remember... Uh, you've been here during one of the floodings at, at Beltmore Village, yeah. maybe? I, I, I was not, but I was down east when there was huge flooding down east. Okay, yeah. so there are always roads that are under construction at any, any time. North Carolina, they say our state flower is that, that orange can on the highway. That's our state flower. <laughs> you see it everywhere you go. Right, um, right. There's always roads under construction. Well, what happens when you have a flooding situation is that roads you would normally use are impassable. And so then that means that any of the roads are under construction that might have been your alternative routes, well, you can't use them. And so people get stuck. And that, that to me is the best description of what's happening with our health system and with our mental health system yeah. during this time, that everything has gotten slowed down. And when you parse it, you can figure out exactly why that's happening. Yeah, but right. a, lot of, a lot of people who would be good to be getting attention yeah. and treatment are not. And that's so it, really the bottom a, line. Yeah, it really is a danger. And I think, you know, to add to what you're saying, um, and again, you know, uh, there's, we, I think there's always a time for, um, I don't know where this comes up in the work of trauma and disaster and what you formally call this, but uh, kind of the, uh, um, well, this is not the right time to use, but the post-mortem, you know, what is the, right. the post-mortem of COVID, we will learn much about ourselves, about our healthcare system, how things need to be different, how things should be different, where we missed the boat, how things need to change. But right now, it doesn't, it doesn't help to blame. The blame is not, not helpful, but there is help in a recognition, perhaps, that, that um, so much of our healthcare system is uh, trying to work this out. Um, you know, we will recall that earliest in the earliest days, uh, you know, you know, don't wear a mask uh, because not because people didn't necessarily know that they could be helpful, but it was really clear that we did not have enough for our medical professionals exactly. and 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 how deeply important it was to have them for our medical professionals. Right. Um, but just that confusion sends enough. Uh, I don't know if the word distrust it, but but enough confusion into the system of our lives. It that created it, confusion. Yeah, it just doesn't help. And then... I think your, your word recognition yeah. is, is probably a very, very good one to focus on as compared to blame. 
Yeah. So blaming, and we could have, you know, blamed till the cows came home about not having enough masks. That right. did not solve the problem. Right. It did not lessen the threat. And when I realized that was happening, and this is, this to me is an example of what I, I call the resilience, but it's saying, yes, we have a problem. We don't have enough masks. And I know, I know a lot about how you, how you create protective gear. I mean, thank God for my medical background, right? Uh, and a friend of mine who does lots of uh, alterations and repairs, I knew that her business was going to be down the tubes. I mean, she was going to have to be, um, she wasn't going to be able to have any customers. And I called her up and I said, would you like to make masks? <laughs> and she <laughs> said, we were just talking about, could we make masks? And I said, uh, and she said, do you know how we're supposed to do that? And I said, yeah, Brigham, uh, um, Women's Brigham Hospital in Boston right. has, a, has the uh, pattern that they want people to use. And I can get it to you. And she said, great. And so it's turned into a real cottage industry for her. And she has been making literally thousands of masks and sending them all over and um, you know I, I help supply some friends who work in a grocery store because it's like I want to be able to w come to shop here and I want you guys to stay well because I want you to stay open and it's like oh good thank you you know and yeah. so taking recognize the problem and then do something about it you know right. create a solution okay right. um, this is what people during Harvey in, in Houston did when the streets were flooding and first responders could not get anywhere. Well, you know, a lot of Houstonians owned boats and they were calling it, uh, um, was it Dunkirk on the Bayou? Yeah, right. You know, where all the yeah. private owners of boats and they'd get on their ham radios and their cell phones and communicate and they created essentially a water water taxis for people. I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. Well, this goes to um, your whole uh, point of um, another whole aspect of our emotional well-being all the time, but certainly in times of trauma and disaster is the nature of being resilient and, and, um, and what resiliency looks like and the, the dynamics to it. Um, I mentioned last week the uh, recent research I've read about uh, the degree to which people in times of trauma and disaster do reach out to communities of faith. Uh, this research specifically was churches, but I know that it's true for, for communities of faith as a whole. And that you know, nearly 50% of individuals who considered themselves not people of faith, said that they would likely reach out to a congregation in a time of trauma and, and disaster. And so I think what that says to me as a, as a, a pastor, as a um, priest, is um, uh, the encouragement really, not just to myself, but to all of us as members of a faith community, that um, there is a place for us. There is a place for who we are, there's a place for what we are. There's a place for the message that we have um, at, at times like this. And it's a message of, of, of hope that, um, that we are loved. <laughs> um, uh, we are, um, uh, um, this will not define us. <laughs> this will not be the last word about who we are and what our lives um, are made of and um, that God always has um, God's uh, best for us in, God's, uh, in, the, in the bottom of God's heart. And so um, I think those are the, the pieces of resilience that are a blessing. And then I might say that also for, for myself, the, a couple of uh, resilient pieces um, uh, or pieces of blessing in this moment have been is and this is not a necessarily an advertisement, but um, you know, during this time, I, I started a new Bible study on Thursday nights that we have we have online, and I know that you join us, and it's um, it's just been like answered prayer in many ways. Um, it's um, 
it's uh, and it's drawn in uh, members and former members <laughs> and uh, people yeah. in Asheville and people outside of Asheville. And it's just been um, something to be able to rejoice in, in a moment like this, which is all I think, as you're suggesting, part of what it means to have resilience and to um, how to employ resilience in time of, of trauma and disaster. Well, Lori, we're getting to the end of our time. And I know that all of this has been so helpful to all of us. I can't thank you enough for all of the uh, your uh, willingness to be present in your time here, but also I know all you're doing for others at this time. And um, thank you for your ministry, because I know it is a ministry. And um, uh, how about this? And uh, we'll keep in touch because there will be, since as you so aptly have uh, shown us, there is ongoing disruption. I'm sure there will be another, a, a few other ways in which we could have a conversation that would be helpful in the months sure. and weeks weeks ahead. So thank you sure. so much. God bless you and uh, stay well, you and yours. As to you as well. Thank All you. All right. Bye-bye.